Welcome, everyone. Happy Wednesday. I hope y'all are excited, um, you know, really uh, as excited as I am for today's session. Um, and we cannot wait to get started. So before we do that, though, um, I just want to say welcome. Um, my name is Meg. I am part of Power to Fly's virtual hosting team, and I am so, so, so happy um, to be with you for our, our amazing event that we have set up for you today. Now, um, I know we are still getting people joining in from the waiting room, so please feel free, file in. Um, we're going to go over some quick housekeeping items before we dive into uh, introductions and the meat and potatoes of today's event. So, um, so something to know for everyone, whether you are you know, new to Power to Fly events or if you haven't joined us in a while, all of our events are about you. Okay, so we want to make sure that you as our audience, as our community, you get to participate as much as possible. You can do that in a couple different ways. Um, if you want to turn your camera on, you are more than welcome to very much encouraged. Uh, you know, it's, it's always a great way to share your um, smiling maskless faces with us safely. Um, do not worry if you are not insta perfect. I think I'm on I think day four of the, the dry shampoo messy bun combo, um, you know, so non-traditional workspaces, furry co-workers, um, you know, pajamas as, as office wear, whatever it is, bring it, you know, please feel free to show up as yourself, wherever you are. We want to make sure that we are there for you. Um, now, if you do have questions for today's speakers, or if you want us to expand on any of the topics, that is awesome. And we highly encourage that participation. So to do that, you can put any questions or comments you might have into the group chat. I'll be in there um, monitoring as we go, um, but that is where we will be, uh, you know, checking out in case y'all have any questions that you want to kind of dive in deeper on, on what our speakers are talking about today. Now, um, if you do come off mute for any reason, you will show up on the live recording of today's event. So we, um, we've changed up permissions. Um, but just in case you do have unmute per, uh, permissions on yours, please make sure that you stay on mute for the duration of the event. That's how we're going to uh, maintain audio clarity on the call. So um, if you do want to participate via questions, feel free to send those in in the Zoom chat. I'll be collecting them and we will try to get to as many as we can during, during today's event. Now, um, like I did say earlier, this session is being recorded. So we are currently uh, recording this. We're live streaming it to our YouTube channel as well as our website. Now, what that means for you is that you don't have to worry about taking notes. You don't have to worry about, you know, if you miss what somebody said or you want to go back and review that resource that we're talking about, you can always go back and rewatch the recording. Now, everyone that registered for today's event, um, so that's everyone that's here right now and probably many people watching this in the future, everybody that registered is going to get an email from Power to Fly in about one to two business days, and it's going to have a link to where you can rewatch this video where, when it's posted on our website. Now, even if you registered and didn't come, if you stay for five minutes, if you stay for the full 60, doesn't matter. Everybody that registered is going to get that link. Now, if you hear something from Pretty or Nikki today that is just so mind blowing, so amazing, you cannot wait to share it with a coworker or a friend or a relative. You don't have to wait the one to two business days. You can always um, head over to our YouTube channel. Like I said, we're live streaming there. I'll share the link um, for that in the chat here in just a moment. Um, but you can you can always go over to our YouTube channel. The video will be posted there usually within about five to 15 minutes of the end of the live stream. Um, and you can check us out there. You can also look up um, a huge section of our, our library of recorded chats. Our entire archive, you can also look at on our website. Those are always free to view. Um, so please, please feel free, share the love. Um, if you are listening here and you hear something amazing and you wanna share it right then, tweet it out, take a video, take, take photos. You're more than encouraged to do this. Um, please feel free to shout out on social. We would love to share or retweet or whatever, anything y'all post. Um, please feel free to tag us. We are at Power to Fly on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, so if you if you have uh, you know have time on your hands, you want to check out those other uh, other social accounts. We share everything, great resources, job links, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, now, like I did say, if you do want to ask a question, um, we we just encourage you to put it into the group chat. But if you have a question that you want to ask and you'd like to be kept anonymous. Doesn't matter the reason, totally fine. You're just gonna send your question to me in a DM. Um, now I just realized I didn't add my name on my display name, so I'm gonna add it now. So you just need to find Meg on the drop down menu, and we will, uh, that's where you can find me there. Now, um, let's see, there we go, y'all. All right, so uh, last but not least, before we introduce our speakers, I just wanna highlight real quick Riot Games. 
Now we are so, so happy to be partnered with Riot Games. I've gotten to host several events with them. They're an, a really amazing company, but if what you're hearing today makes you curious and makes you wanna learn a little bit more about Riot Games, um, we absolutely encourage that. So I'm gonna share the link with you here in just a moment to where you can check out Riot Games company page on powertofly.com. Now there's that link for you in the chat thread. Um, you're going to get to a page that looks much like what you see in front of you. And once you're there, you can find out all kinds of interesting things. You can get more info about Riot Games, who they are as a company. You can click on events to watch not only uh, past events that they've done with us, but also uh, you know see signups already in place for future events that they might do. And as always, you can check out their open roles. Now, I think the post says 563. I'm looking at the live uh, page right now and it says 591. So as you can see, there's always new jobs being posted. Um, but we definitely recommend that you take a look at those roles. Now, if you are interested in Riot Games, but maybe you don't see anything that really fits your skill set or what you're looking to, um, you know, what you're looking to do as a career, that is totally fine. What I recommend is at the top of that page on the far right hand side, there's going to be a button that says follow. If you click that button, it's going to do some really great things for you. But essentially what it does is it works like your friend at the company. So it's going to tell Riot Games that you are interested in working with them even before you fill out a job application. But it's also going to keep Riot Games on your radar because it, we're going to alert you when they post a new role. So it's, it's a really great way to make sure that you stay up to date without having to feel like you're constantly, you know, circling on job boards that seemingly never change. So please feel free to take advantage of that. You can do that for as many companies as you'd like on Power to Fly, but obviously I very much recommend that you check out Riot Games. Um, now, to introduce you to our speakers today, I hope y'all are just like as excited as I am um, to hear from these wonderful women. Um, so first up, we have Nikki Lewis. Now, Nikki is an entertainment marketing executive. Um, she's got 16 plus years experience in convincing middle schoolers around the world to play her games and not the ones that the other guys are doing. Um, so I love that that descriptor of your job. It's it's so, so clear. I absolutely love this. Um, currently, Nikki leads marketing for the action category at Riot Games. And prior to that, she was involved with the League of Legends franchise and led marketing for that as well. Um, now, Nikki is a Harlem, New York City native, um, and in her spare time, she plays a lot of Civ Six, which is one of my husband's favorite games, um, and entertains the toddlers of others, um, something that I know that I can look forward to relatively soon since my kids all or my friends all started just having babies. Um, so, Nikki, I am incredibly excited to dig in more with you um, and, and share your experiences with our, our community today. Is there anything else about your background that you think uh, people should know before we dive into questions? I'm a big fan of thin crust pizza. <laughs> yes, love it. Okay, good level setting there. Thank you. Now, joining Nikki from Riot. Um, is also Pretty. Um, so Pretty is a currently a lead, the lead designer, or sorry, lead producer for Valorant's in-game monetization initiative. And this is where she oversees all of the cosmetic content and the systems that help support player expression and customization, um, AKA some of the really fun stuff to do uh, when you're first starting in on a game or you wanna change up what your character looks like. Like, I love this. Um, now, before she was part of the video game industry, Pretty graduated from Cornell Law School um, and practiced law for the federal government in DC. And she's also um, she also wrote an award-winning undergraduate thesis paper on the social aspects of video gaming, um, which I would find honestly pretty fascinating to listen to. So I uh, kind of want to ask you for a link to that. Um, but yeah, really, really excited to dig in um, with Pretty as well. Pretty, is there anything else you want to share with our audience um, before we go into our questions? I also like pizza. Yes, love it. Lo I'm, I'm loving all the love for this, the, uh, the thin crust pizza, it's amazing. Um, all right, now, last but not least, these are what you're seeing on your screen right now are some of the main takeaways that you can expect to, uh, to get from today's session. Now, we identified these um, in a couple different ways, but mostly through conversations with our speakers, as well as by taking a look at the questions that you all submitted when you registered today. So. These are some of the areas we're gonna to touch on, but just understand you have the ability to drive today's conversation. So if, if Nikki says something that you wanna dig in deeper on, or you want Preeti to expand on some idea that she's talking about in one of her responses, let us know. Um, if you asked a question or you know um, submitted a question when you registered and you're worried we won't get to it, 
send it again, send it in the chat thread. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get to as many, um, as many audience questions today as we can. Now, just know that when you have that, you know, that ability to control what's going on, we love it, but take advantage of it. Because if you took time out of your day to be here live with us for the recording, we want to make sure that the time that you spend with Power to Fly and Riot Games is well worth it. So cannot wait to dig in on today's questions. So let's get started here. Um, one of the first questions that we were asked, and I think this is a really, really interesting one, um, and probably something a lot of people are starting to ask, is it ever too early or too late to get started in gaming? Um, you know, how can we get to know more about the industry if you are maybe not necessarily someone that has been gaming for, you know, 5, 10, 15 years? Um, Nikki, do you want to take us, uh, kick us off on this? Yeah, I love that question. Uh, so it is never too late and it is never too early. Definitely not. I think one of the best ways to really get to know the industry and try to figure out uh, what you might want to do in it is to follow uh, some of the industry uh, press outlets, like Polygon, for example, is a really good one just to get a general sense of what games are coming out, what, what do journalists at least think players want from games these days. It's very, very overview-y that way. Um, and then after that, I'd recommend finding a game or two that you really enjoy and checking out the top streamers of that game, because sometimes the top streamers, they know so much about a game that they're almost developers in a sense themselves, who are, or at least um, they get really into the details of why certain game decisions are being made by the game developer. And that can also give you a really good sense of, okay, you know, what are what kind of goes on in the, in the thought process for making a game but those are two really good sort of intro activities uh but really it's never too early or too late the games industry has so many different types of jobs for whatever it is your craft is there's probably that job in the video game industry excellent love it um pretty do you have anything else to add on this yeah uh Something that helped me a lot was actually attending the Game Developers Conference. Um, it's this giant industry-wide conference. It's not like E3 where they're showing off games. It's specifically for um, individuals who work in the game industry. And there's a ton of talks there. GDC also has a whole vault full of videos that you can watch. Um, there's also a bunch of free videos. You don't have to pay for a subscription. You can first mm -hmm. test it out. But um, going to the Game Developers Conference was really helpful for me. I was able to meet a lot of people and network. And that's actually where I met Riot. So um, for me, it definitely worked out. And I think the uh, advice I got a lot um, was make a game. And at least for me, I don't have the hard skills to, nor was I willing to learn them. I wasn't going to code or do art or whatever. But if you are somebody like that, um, you can certainly do that. I guess I'm lying a little bit too, because actually what I was able to do was write. Um, so I wrote articles uh, for a couple of outlets. Um, so I did that and I actually joined Riot as a writer. So I guess technically I did my version of make a game. I did the work that I wanted to get hired for. Okay, cool. I love that. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about kind of this idea of too late. If you are potentially an older person kind of entering gaming, um, I mean, I, I'm 35 and I played like PlayStation and, you know, like really little kind of baby games when I was in high school, but I haven't really gamed much since then. Um, so are there any, um, you know, kind of on a personal tangent, are there any games that you recommend for somebody that's trying to get into, into and testing out like the field of gaming, but you know, maybe can't, uh, can't handle steering and, and, you know, uh, walking and moving your camera at the same time. Um, you know, what's, what's something that you liked that was an intro game for you? Pretty, how about you? Uh, I, so I've been playing games since I was four and a half. So it's a little hard for me. No way. Uh, yeah, it's a little hard. Um, but I think, um, it's hard, it's hard to say, cause it's what's going to click with you. So, I would say if you have friends who play games, uh, straight, Nikki streamer idea is great. Um, you're ultimately, it's like someone asks you when I want to work out and you're like, well, what does that mean? Do you like to run? Do you like to lift weights? Like yes, try it yes. out um, and see what sticks. It's really hard for someone to say you should go play football or you should run a marathon, right? It one size yes. isn't at all. Um, I forget the other part of your question. No, no. Um, like what was, what was something that got you into it? Um, so that's, that's awesome. Nikki, oh, how about okay. you? Have you also been doing this since you were uh, single digits? Yeah, <laughs> since I was a wee, wee little girl. But 
um, if I were trying to get in right now today, I think uh, Pri's advice is so good. Uh, I would think about maybe what kind of world do I want to spend some time in, right? And then pick a game that corresponds to that world. So I'm going to throw Animal Crossing out there because I think a lot of, this, maybe this is too stereotypical, but I think a lot of female-ish type humans really love a game where you're kind of the master of like a, of a domain, <laughs> Right. You know, and it's like, oh, I can plan out all the little things that come, go on in here and see how that all sort of filters up to the whole. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And also the game. Um, I like violent games, but a lot of women don't or a lot of human beings don't. And Animal Crossing is not not violent. So that might be like a, a gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love this. Uh, I'm getting a ton of people chiming in in the chat thread. Um, I think Steve said uh, something about Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot was my jam along with uh, Spyro. Um, so I'm I'm hideously old at this point, but I grew those up on are some of my favorites. Like Quake, <laughs> like at Doom. I grew up on very hardcore games that little children oh. probably can play. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, I can't even imagine trying to tackle that. Love it. Um, okay, so... Once we've talked about, you know, kind of working into the industry, do you think that you have to have played games for a very long time to work in the industry? Or do you think it's something that it's okay to come to the industry and be fresh to gaming? Nikki, what about you? I'll start here. It depends on what you're looking to do in the industry, right? So probably my answer would probably be pretty different from P's because I'm in marketing. And in marketing, you don't have to start out being a person that plays a lot of games. You just have to play a lot of the games that you're responsible for communicating about, right? So we often have people that start in marketing that um, don't really game at all, uh, but we always start them out with a steady diet of uh, your first couple of weeks, we need you to play this game like 20 to 40 hours <laughs> that you're going to be working on and really understand that audience. And as long as you can find joy in doing that as part of your job, at least on the business in the business functions like marketing, finance, IT, HR, uh, you don't have to come in as someone that plays a lot. But I think you're better at your job once you get here if you do play a lot. There's a ton of love in the thread for this idea of, of being told, you have to play this game. <laughs> There's like a ton of people saying this is their dream. Um, Pretty, how, how do you think on this? Like, do you think that it's something that is easy to transition into, um, you know, depending on, on the role that you want to work in? Yeah, I think um, what's really important is to have empathy for um, the people that you are creating stuff for. And I would take this even out of games. Like if I were to go work for like, I don't know, like Chips Ahoy, I would, I, was, I don't know, Nestle, I don't, sorry, whatever. If I was, if I was, I would eat cookies if it meant that I was going to be making some, making cookies for people, right? Like, yeah. Um, so likewise, if you're going to work on games, um, you should understand the game you're working on. And the best way to do that is to actually play the game you're working on. Um, likewise, um, you know, you, it de and it's not just about playing games in general. It's about playing that game or the audience that would play similar games. So Nikki and I are on Valorant, and that means not just playing other games, but also specifically playing Valorant and understanding Valorant. And it does take time, but um, people are here to help you. Um, like I had not played attack shooter before Valorant. That's a specific subgenre, right? So I don't know how mm -hmm. familiar everyone here is with shooters, but there's games and there's shooters and then there's attack shooters. I had not played attack shooters. I'd played shooters. I'd played like a bunch of Halo games and stuff, but it had also been years since then. So coming into attack shooters, I was like, no, I don't really know this, but the team was awesome. This was many years ago, but the team spent a lot of time teaching me and I would ask questions. I would go over my, like I'd record my game and I'd be like, why did I die here? And the designers would walk me through it. And they were all really excited to teach me. And I was initially intimidated. I was like, oh, everyone's going to think I'm stupid. But no, actually, they were so excited to, that I wanted to learn. So I really benefited from hours and hours of like immersion into this like world. So I feel a lot more comfortable with it. And I play Valorant a ton now. But um, I guess the best way to say that is like, don't be afraid, ask like people love to teach other people things. So take advantage yeah. of that. I like Find that. a friend who's playing the game that you want to play and say, can we play together? 
Yes. Oh, I, I absolutely love these ideas. I'm telling you, y'all, the, the chat is blowing up over here. I'm going to have to go back and, re and reread stuff later on, but this is really, really cool. And I'm loving seeing all these people connecting, um, you know, not only over these games that they love, but also at, you know, the idea of working within them. Um, now, if you are talking to somebody who is looking to land their very first job in the gaming industry, what is the number one thing that you would tell that person? Um, Preeti, do you want to go first? Uh, I would say that it's not a linear path, um, that with anything, if you're trying to get into something for the first time, it is going to take a lot of persistence. Um, I did a career swap and it was really hard. And I don't actually remember how many times I got rejected or someone didn't respond to me or whatever, but I don't remember it because I don't think it was important. It's ultimately that I'm here. Um, so it is in some ways a numbers and persistence game, and it's about acquiring the skills that you need. So what I would tell people is like, if you're trying, like, don't look at the short term of like, oh, it's not working. I give up, like invest in your long term and, and eventually you will get there. And even within your role, like Nikki and I did not start in the exact same roles that we're in now, uh, as I mentioned before, I was in writing and then eventually moved into production and then into game production. So the path is not linear and it is, it takes a ton of dedication and persistence to get there as with anything. Yeah, that's also very true. Nikki, how about you? You know, plus one of that, I think if you um, if you have a, uh, a craft that's a business function, it might be easier to get in. But at the same time, if you don't want to stay in that business function, it can sometimes be hard to switch over to development. So I would say don't be afraid to take like several steps back and start kind of at the at the bottom, even though you might have a lot of experience in a different area, because all that experience is not going to be wasted. It's going to come into play and you're going to rise quickly. Right. You know, and so I think um, uh, if you have uh, project management experience or strategy experience, product management or production at the very junior levels could be a way in, but you still have to make the case about how your experiences can translate over. And it's much easier to do that at uh, lower level jobs and then work your way back up. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, um, I am one. Some oh, sorry. Oh, can I plus one, Nikki? Like as somebody who yes. also took a step back, like went from a lawyer, which was like the end goal of the career of spending three years in law school to be like, I want to be in games. And I had to make a choice of how I was going to get into games. And I had a recruiter very bluntly at GDC tell me, I don't understand. Are you trying to get in in just a field? Because I think at the time I was actually like, oh, I think I want to be in marketing. Uh, or do you want to be a lawyer uh, in games? Like, which one is it? But you have to pick and you can't say both. And I was like, oh, that's really good feedback. Um, but ultimately, yes, I did. I went through marketing for a copywriting role uh, as a writer, and that was entry level, um, especially compared that to lawyer, right? But that was, for me, that was like, okay, I'm willing to do this because I know eventually, like, I'll figure out, navigate my path and figure out exactly what I do. But do prepare for that. And for some people, it's not for them, right? They're not, they're in, they're happy in their careers. And they realize like, no, I don't really want to take a step back right now. Um, I want to keep growing in the path I'm on. And that's good. It's good to do that exploration and make that decision. Okay, great. Um, all right. So we're getting a lot of really great questions in the chat thread. Keep sending them in, y'all. I'm going to um, grab as many as I can. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about some of the people that you look up to or that you, uh, that inspire you within the industry. Um, are there any other women leaders in the field that, that really are, are people that you kind of look to for inspiration? Nikki, why don't you go first on this one? We, we might have the same one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's our boss, um, Anna Donlin. So she's the, uh, I think, I don't want to be presumptuous, but she's someone that I look up to greatly in the industry. Um, she is the executive producer for uh, the Valorant franchise, which is going to have a whole bunch of games in it. And um, she's made games for a very long time and uh, has come up when the industry was like way less friendlier to women. So she's seen some shit, right? Uh, but she always maintains just this really optimistic and positive attitude about both what we're doing for our players and then also what we can accomplish together as women and as just as people, regardless of gender. And um, yeah, so that's mine. Excellent. Pretty, how about you? Anna, obviously, for all the reasons. And I'm also going to say Nikki. 
Uh, so there you go. <laughs> hey, love this. Um, all right. So when um, let's talk about kind of what your experience has been um, in gaming so far. Do you think or would you share a moment or share something with us that you've seen or been a part of that really helps to show that the gaming industry is more inclusive than it was when you started? Um, I think this is something that's, you know, pretty, pretty well known and well recognized about the industry as a whole, but it is being changed. So what changes there have you seen? Uh, Pretty, how about you go first? I think um, just generally we have more diversity. Um, Something I noticed when I first came over to Riot from the legal field was that it was super diverse. Um, and I was working out on the East coast too. So I'm like already, it was a very diverse environment in Washington, DC, but it was even more diverse here. And, and this is back in 2013. And now I look and the team is even, even more diverse, um, to speak specifically about Valorant. I think, um, maybe when I joined, we had, the team was also really tiny, probably like 30 people. I think I'm ballparking here, but maybe three or four women. Um, and now like I have, just three or four female producers on my team. And my team is one team of many teams. So um, it's just, I think as um, the industry has gotten more mature, um, more people have felt comfortable joining the industry and staying in the industry. So that has certainly changed. Nikki, what about you? Yeah, I will plus one that just, you know, from my time here at Riot, I've seen that when there is one woman on a team, then there can be two. And when there are two, then there can be four, you know, (laughs) and uh, I've definitely seen that happening at Riot where like women are looking around for uh, companies and teams where uh, they can feel welcome. And the more of us there are, the more we feel welcome. So um, that has felt very different in the last five years. I love that. I, and you're right. I mean, it is very much where, where you see one person, you feel a little bit more safe because you see somebody that, that you think that you relate to that you, is going to support you. And you're right. I mean, that's something that has been a huge focus for a lot of people at power to fly as well is, you know, it doesn't matter if you're first, you have to make sure you're not last. You have to make sure that you are not the last woman that gets to sit, sit at that table or the last um, black person that gets to sit at the table or whatever your your intersectionalities mean for you. Like it is about continuously passing that baton or at minimum making it easier for people to get into this than the, you know, than the road that you had to walk to do it. Um, so I absolutely, I love this. <laughs> So I had, I had four jobs on my team under me to fill in the last 12 months. And I filled two with women and that was not by accident. I, th- I love that you said it's not by accident. Cause that's one of the things that we try and, and push to people is like, you know, if you have, if you want a field of wildflowers, yeah, let that go, let it be organic, do whatever you want. But if you are trying to, if you're trying to, to cultivate a rose garden, you don't just let it go and see what happens. You take actions that are going to lead to seeing what you want out there. Um, and you're right. I mean, it's one of these things that you have to make these decisions consciously and knowing that, knowing what you're doing, knowing what influences you're bringing into your game or you're bringing into your company culture um, that are going to help to make it better, make it more inclusive, make it more representative of the the community that you serve. Um, I love that. Now, okay, let's talk a little bit about from, you know, kind of the perspective for the both of you as women of color. um, What do you think would help make the industry more welcoming for other women of color that want to be involved in making the games, not just playing them? Uh, Preeti, how about you? I think um, as a general principle, um, uh, thinking about this is, I guess, is a question on authenticity, right? Um, it's going to the people that understand what's being made and getting their honest and direct feedback. Um, so actually I would like Nikki to talk about this a little more. I believe she was working on this, but when League of Legends was working on a champion, um, Nikki was part of a group that they consulted with. Am I right, Nikki? Yeah. And they specifically asked Nikki for feedback because they're like, Hey, we're trying to do a thing. We want this to feel authentic can you tell us what you think? And being, putting yourself out there to be like, I might be wrong, but also being open to hearing other people's opinions and voices on that. People who are quote unquote experts on this, right? They live that every day. Uh, I think that's part of it. Yeah, I'd like to double click on that example because I think definitely 
when game developers and marketers can make sure that the things that they're putting out there authentically represent uh, uh, less represented communities, that definitely makes more people want to work in the industry for sure. And it definitely makes more people want to play those games. Um, and, um, you know, with Senna, it was the first black female uh, League of Legends champion. And the team, there weren't that many black people on the team, but they really wanted to get her hair texture and her skin color right. And so they asked myself and some other black women at work to help them. And we were just like, we'd never been, it was such a special moment because no one had ever asked us our opinion on shit like that, <laughs> right? And so it really changed um, and she is a queen <laughs> and it really changed kind of my feelings about Riot Games in a positive direction. But I, I hope that we also, I know that we also positively impacted gamers with that character and then Valorant, that's just the Valorant DNA. And that's just what we do on a Tuesday on Valorant, you know. I love this. You're honestly like, you're getting me a little, a little verklempt here. Um, but like, I, I mean, I, I watch my husband play games a lot. And that was one of the things that struck me more and more, um, you know, and he plays a, a bunch of different ones kind of all over the map, but most recently he was in some game and they gave you the option to like pick different body types and nothing was labeled male or female, nothing. Everything was, do you want to do this one or that one? And like, you could do everything from, you know, like you said, like changing your facial features or changing like your hairstyle and all that kind of stuff. But it was a much broader range of, of not just representation, but also like kind of bonkers. Like, like if you want to have like green tentacles coming out of your head or whatever, but I always thought, I just thought it was the coolest thing to get to see that it's not from a binary perspective. Like why does it need to be? It doesn't. And so I love kind of seeing that sort of stuff. And you're right, Nikki, like being able to see yourself in a game or to even know that like the designers want you to be able to see yourself in a game is huge, especially for people who, who have felt like they don't really see themselves, at least not traditionally speaking, like, you know, it, within the industry, they're not very well represented. So I, I cannot tell you how much I love hearing this. Um, all right. So we did get a lot of questions from people that were, you know, fresh out of boot camps or coming up on graduations. Um, a lot of uh, people kind of wrote in with very similar experiences, um, being either fresh out or being ready to graduate and kind of having no idea where to start. Um, one of the questions in particular said, um, do I really need one to three years of experience before I can start applying to entry level roles? Now, what is obviously y'all, uh, you know, don't have a, an elbow lock on the, the industry. You can't tell us what it's like everywhere. But in your experience, do you really need that one to three years? Is this something that, you know, is a barrier to people starting to apply for stuff? Um, or is it something that, you know, you really can, can't start applying too soon because this is what you want to do? I don't know. Pretty, what do you think? It's going to depend on the role. Um, and the reality is, is like, um, Nikki kind of hinted toward this, which is like, you will catch up, right? So if you come in with experience doing other things that are similar, it's still work experience. Like people like to ask me like, oh, so how often do you use your law degree slash law knowledge? I'm like, I don't know, zero, but I'm not because I'm not literally like litigating cases, but I think the way I think about things, probably some form of discipline and communication, I'm not sure it's a it's me um, is because of that experience. Right. Three years of school and then working as a lawyer for two years. So I would say, like, if you're straight out of school, yeah, I think you need a little bit of experience to just show that you have experience doing things. Ideally, you're also doing things in school uh, that show like leadership. Um, we have. In, us and other companies have internship programs. That's where we hire a lot of folks straight out of school. But the reality is like, yeah, if I have a role open, very rarely are we going to have a role. Um, and I've seen this called out on like LinkedIn and stuff like, hey, this is a rare opportunity. We just want somebody with passion and zero experience. That's super rare. The reality is we want people to come in and be able to be effective. We're, we are a live game that has tons of players that want value now. So I need someone who's going to come in and know how to do the job to some degree. So it is unfortunate. And that's how Nikki mentioned, like there may be other roles that you can come in and, and like learn some transferable skills. Um, there's a producer that's on my team named Laura. I hope she's watching, but she used to work for Nikki and she wanted to, and marketing and she had a marketing background. And then eventually I stole her and now she works on games. So 
that was, you know, a path for Laura specifically, but Laura also came to Nikki with years of experience as well. So probably not what you all wanted to hear, but yes, you probably do need to get some relevant experience because you're just going to catch people's eye more and be more effective. And you'll be better when you get here too. So please get some experience or yeah. apply for an internship if you're in school. Yeah. Yes. We've got yeah, a ton like, of questions about internships. Sorry, Nikki, just before you go, we have a ton of people asking questions about internships and such. So if anybody from the Riot Games uh, team that's on the line here wants to share where they should go or where they can, can, can kind of find that information readily, please, please feel free to share that. Um, Cause I know we've got a lot of people interested because the, people are loving what you're saying in today's chat. So thank you to you both. Um, Nikki, i uh, sorry to interrupt. What would you like to say? I'm just a hard plus one on that. And uh, just to get in into, get into it some more, right? So if a, a, sometimes a smaller game company will take a chance on you, right? Especially if you um, are playing their, if their games in beta and you're playing it and you know a lot about it, or you know a lot about games in that category, you can try and get that experience by getting into a smaller company and maybe you'll love it and stay forever, but maybe you go to a bigger company. So that's one thing. And then if you're still in school, you should get some of your friends together and just make a game. Go download Unity. Um, they have um, a bunch of different things that I'm kind of getting out of my depth, but they have a bunch of different building blocks <laughs> to help, right? And let's say you're an artist, find an engineer that wants to help you make a game together, or you're a writer and you want to write out the game. You know, there are different people that you can partner with just in your school, to just make your first terrible, shitty game with free tools. And that counts as some experience. Yes. Awesome. Um, do you have any tips for anybody that's still in school? Any, anything for, for students or people that are, you know, maybe trying to teach themselves this kind of stuff on the side? Um, what should people know as they're still learning before they actually try and get into the industry? Well, I would say join the Unity communities and the Unreal Engine communities because both of those communities online have just like a ton of different learning options for almost every different part of the game development process, right? Um, sorry, quick plug, I used to work on Unreal Engine, so I really love that product. <laughs> and there's a lot of different things you can really teach yourself before you uh, get out of school. Um, full stop. Very cool. All right, pretty. how about you? Yeah, um, I think, at least when I've looked at intern applications, um, if you are somebody with a hard skill, so like art, um, engineering, obviously like stuff related to that, internships related to that, projects, um, whatnot. Uh, if it's if you've worked on a game with friends, if you're in game design school, you don't have to be in design school, but if you are working on a game together, uh, for the soft skills, um, I look, I don't really care about a person's degree. Um, what I care about is um, stuff that they do in their like extracurriculars. So uh, for example, like for producers, I'm like, oh, okay. Or production uh, interns, um, are they like working on like their teams, like club, like their esports, like Valorant, let's say esports Valorant, like team or something. And there's somebody I interviewed a while ago. It was like helping them coordinate like scrims and games and stuff. I'm like, okay, cool. Making sure the team like has access to all the stuff they need so they can focus on playing the game. Like, oh, that sounds like a producer um, or producer skills. Um, yeah, just do things that are going to demonstrate like some the person you're interviewing can connect the dots like oh that sounds like i'm sure for nikki that might be like oh i i like worked on a marketing campaign for something at school like a i don't know something we're doing with like adopting pets okay cool that sounds like marketing um and then i actually do care a lot about grades i know that's a little weird but to me um grades are one way for me to assess that a person is like hyper focused and dedicated to excellence and i'm like wow you have good grades and you've also done all these other things like you're somebody that will do things that no one is forcing you to do like high school that's a good parents point, make yeah. you go college you don't have to and by the way that doesn't mean you need a college degree but i will be impressed if you also have really good grades and you're also doing cool things like in games so it's just ways to stand out yeah i love that we are getting a ton of questions in the chat as well um so i i want to grab a couple of these because they kind of they dovetail really nicely with what we were going to ask y'all next um, now there are many misconceptions about who can get into gaming. There's a lot of gatekeeping, uh, kind of stuff like that, that has, that can happen sometimes. What can you tell us about people from different backgrounds? You know, people from that are transitioning from other roles. We've had people ask about teaching. They've asked about finance. 
Um, you know, what have you seen from these people with non-traditional backgrounds who, who enter the gaming industry? You know, what has your experience been? You know, have you worked with people like this? Pretty, I know you can speak from a, a wholly, uh, you know, um, personal experience place. Um, so why don't you kick us off on this? Uh, I, I got a little lost in the question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, question of fault. where have you seen, um, you know, when you, when you're looking at people coming into this industry from completely non-traditional backgrounds, have you seen them be successful? Are there certain industries that seem to translate very well into this? Um, Cause we've got people talking about everything from an insurance background to teaching um, to finance. Uh, so what have you seen in your experience with people that come from these non-traditional backgrounds, knowing that you came out of law school? Yeah, it's uh, it depends. Um, so like, let's take finance. Um, there are finance jobs at Riot. I don't know anything about them. Um, I assume finance has a bunch of specialties that I'm not aware of, but I can talk to law. Um, I was a labor lawyer and the job, at least at the time, what I understood the type of lawyers that Riot would have hired, it was uh, maybe like corporate law or something or employment law. I don't know. It was like something else. So even within that, there are differences. I would guess the closest parallel would be the same type of job, um, but like going in, you know, going to the finance team or something like that. Um, if you're looking to completely swap like I did, so I was like, pretend I don't have a law degree. Hi, I'm applying for this job. Um, uh, I don't know. I guess it's how you talk about your transferable skills, but it is about the other things you do. It's for me personally, if I got an application put in front of me of somebody who's like, uh, I was a teacher or like, a, you know, I worked in finance. I'm like, oh, that's cool. But is that going to help me immediately fill this job today? Probably not. But then you also have to consider the level of the job. If I, if that person's applying to like run an entire team, I'm like, uh, they don't know how to make games yet. I wouldn't take that kind of chance. If they're coming in at a much more junior level with an eagerness to learn, that's something else. Um, I'll use another specific example, another producer. Hi, Kathy. Um, Kathy on my team uh, came from Disney and she spent like seven years um, working on like Disney parks, like the, the rides and stuff. Sounds really cool, right? She wanted to be in games. And I'm like, she's really, really talented, but she doesn't know how to make games yet. And I talked to her. I'm like, I'd love to offer you this job, but you're going to come in at a more junior level. And she is doing awesome. I'm super proud of her. And I'm probably embarrassing her more, but she has been promoted since then. So and it's only been a little while. So um, but she was really willing to take that step back in her career to do something she was passionate about. And that's very similar to me. Excellent. Excellent. Um, Nikki, how about you? Non-traditional backgrounds. Okay. Um, so the thing that helped me the most, uh, because that the MBA is not like a prized, nobody cares about that degree in this field, right? So it didn't really help me that much. But what did help me was that there were people, alumni of my school, that were working in gaming. And so since I also had kind of less non-traditional and pretty, but still kind of non-traditional, how I actually got in was I just went and um, talked to these people. And some of them were kind enough to talk to me about what it was that they did in their jobs. And just the fact that I took that initiative got me a job interview. Eventually that became my first job in the industry. So whatever school you go to, there's probably somebody at that school that works in gaming. And like, if you're nice about it, send them a nice note, offer them some free food, people like pizza, they'll probably come talk to you about what they do. And then one day they'll probably hear about something and they might think of you. And um, that worked out for me. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get through a ton more questions in the chat. If y'all have follow-up questions for the Riot Games team, I will, will get you information on who you can reach out to. Um, but until we do, I'm going to try and keep racing towards uh, as many questions as we can in the last 15 minutes. Um, we had a lot of people that were incredibly touched, Nikki, by, by what you were talking about um, in, in regards to designing Senna. Um, a lot of people wanted to talk about uh, the Filipino um, player as well. So when we talk about kind of cultural backgrounds, especially of the agents in these games, where does the inspiration come from and how do you manage not to get into like a stereotype of a specific country or region, but still give them, you know, a, a cultural context and a, a personality to them. Um, Pretty, would you like to start? Uh, sure. So Nikki and I are going to be kind of speaking outside of our direct uh, expertise here because neither of us actually designs the agents. Nikki and our team market them. Uh, my team will support with some of the cosmetics that we attach to the agents. Um, 
I'm going to kind of take the same approach I do with, honestly, it's going to sound a bit weird at first, but with like gun skins that we make. So if I'm, my team is making a gun skin and this is for players like who like love dark fantasy, right? We're going to go to players who love like dark, like elf fantasies. They want to be a necromancer when they play this game and say, Hey, do you think this is cool? Um, you talk to, you essentially talk to experts. So in knowing uh, the folks on the character team, I know that they did a ton of work uh, connecting with Filipinos like across Riot and then also working um, with the Filipino team, uh, uh, sorry, the, the team over there. Um, and actually, because we have regional teams around the world and actually asking them like, hey, like, can you help us uh, think through this? They, they spent countless hours. Nikki can probably talk to this way better, but I know the team that works on this and I know how committed they were. And it wasn't about checking a box. It wasn't about, hey, like, look, we did we did the steps. It was really about like, how is this going to feel? And I remember one specific anecdote, the producer over there, John was telling me, which is like, there's a scene where, um, and I think it's in the trailer Nikki and her team produced, there's like a, a broom. Uh, right. And Nikki, Nikki, maybe you should just take it from here, but apparently that is like very symbolic and it touched a lot of people, but you don't get that authenticity by guessing. Um, it's through a ton of hard work and caring. Go ahead, Nikki. I'm trying to unmute and I'm struggling. <laughs> yeah. You know, I was trying to figure out which button to press too. You know, I think that, um, you know, just to like uh, plus one, what Pretty said, you know, neither of us are on that uh, team for Neon, but we, uh, I feel so proud of Neon. I, I feel proud that Riot was able to do something like that because we did what Pretty said. We just asked. We asked humans, Filipino humans, <laughs> both the ones that were on the team themselves, because uh, several of the key creative uh, leads for that uh, agent were Filipino American. But we also had that team in uh, um, in Southeast Asia, and we asked them as well. And we didn't just ask them once. We had long, long, many conversations back and forth. Uh, I can double click a little bit on the marketing asset, you know. So on that one, what the team and the Philippines told us was that actually, you know what, a lot of Filipinos have the experience of like, like working abroad. It's a big thing that happens. It's this, this huge diaspora of Filipinos that are in Australia or different parts of Asia and America. And it's lonely, right? You like, um, you just, you, know, you look for things that make you feel like you're at home and you might take your room that you're living in or your apartment and put certain things in there. Uh, and that's how we found out about all those things. I'm actually, I don't even know all the little things, but that's how we found out that A, this is a thing that's a very common experience for Filipinos, and B, these are some of the real things that they do to feel more at home in the places that they live. Um, but it starts with asking, like really, really asking. Yes, I love that they, like that those conversations are, are even happening. And I feel like, you know, it's kind of important to, to highlight this because it's very easy for, for companies to get... Um, kind of get a, a bad rap about like basically just having diversity for diversity's sake. Um, but it's it's really interesting, you know, to hear that breakdown, especially from somebody who's not on the designing team, but is hearing about all of these things. And, and it's not just important to the design team, it's important to everyone. Um, so I absolutely, I love hearing that level of commitment to, to that mission, um, you know, not just from the design team or not just from the HR team. Um, I absolutely love that. Um, okay, so we have about 10 minutes left, and I know this time always goes really, really fast. So we're going to try and go into some kind of maybe a little bit of popcorn, just a little bit. Um, but we'll try and get to as many games or many uh, questions here as we can, because y'all have been coming through with some great questions in here. Um, let's see, we did have a question. Um, people wanted to talk a little bit about like your past experiences. So in, you know, in, in like an actionable kind of practical setting, what are some tips that you would give someone to position their, their past experiences if they are transitioning into gaming? So if, if somebody comes across your desk and like they're going to talk to you about why they want to switch from lion entertainment into gaming, what do you think is the best way to present your, your skills or present your past experiences in that setting? Uh, Nikki, do you want to start? Yeah, I want to start because on the marketing side, there are actually a couple of hacks, right? So um, the two main hacks on the marketing side are um, you can give some context on your experience as a writer, right? Because almost every job in marketing starts in with writing. <laughs> and if you can 
show proof points that you are a good and convincing writer in short form, then that is very directly transferable to a number of different marketing jobs. And then the other one for writing is to put some context around your social media presence, right? So if you can show that you grew a social media account into like the low, like five, six, 7,000, right? I almost hire people with no experience to, to do social media stuff because if you can get a bunch of followers like that, you probably know more than the average 45 year old uh, uh, marketing exec. And that is my age, right? So I'm, I'm dissing on myself. But those sorts of things are within your control for work that you can do right now and then easily show how that um, translates to a job, at least in video game marketing. Excellent. Pretty, what do you think? Uh, Nikki's tip about writing is right. I think to extend that to production, um, it is about um, wanting to be a leader. Um, anybody in production is a leader, no matter how junior. So leading, uh, wanting to control chaos, help people focus on their jobs. Like people sometimes are doing production work without even realize they're doing it. And often we find people come from other backgrounds like art or something. And they're like, I just ended up in production because I got sick and tired of all the chaos and I tried to help solve it. Um, so yeah, you would sell it as like, um, I want to like, like basically learn how to help the dev team become more efficient. For me personally, it was, I really cared about what we were creating um, and why those decisions were made. Um, I, Cause I also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, came from marketing at Riot. So for me, I was like, oh, I'm really interested in how we present this stuff to players. Like someone made a thing, now players are absorbing it. And then I use that to be like, well, how did we make the decision to make that thing? So for Senna, right? If you could imagine, it's like, oh, this is how we presented Senna, but how did we make Senna is what was exciting to me. So, and also just generally passion. Maybe that's the hack. Like when we meet people who are like deeply passionate, they've autom they've already done the research and thought about it. And um, that is really inspiring. Somebody who's like just eager to learn. Uh, I mm -hmm. lately like have realized I value like curiosity and a desire to learn, a desire to be wrong and what not more than anything, because that person will just grow faster than anyone with just raw talent. We have hired some, I, I myself have hired some people that just came in and they knew so much about League of Legends. And I was just like, damn, I'll fucking give you some kind of job here. <laughs> like, we'll figure something out. So just hard plus one and pretty on that. Oh my gosh, y'all, there's so many people that want to work at Riot. Um, one person had asked for new grads who want to work at Riot as part of the marketing team, what skills and experiences would you be looking for with those entry level or junior roles? Um, so what, what is something that will, will give you a bit of an in or something that is, is that you all are looking for as part of, you know, kind of the secret sauce at Riot? Well, on the marketing side is all social media experience, <laughs> like social media knowledge, social media experience, everything that we do. There's nothing that we do in marketing that is not just social media at this point. That is the only media. And we still have a lot to learn, like tons. Like uh, we're all struggling to, to figure out TikTok. I know, right? But like, we're like mostly millennials. So we don't know TikTok. Yeah. Anybody out there know TikTok? <laughs> like, I, I can't talk. I can't do the TikTok. Uh, yeah, if y'all know about TikTok, hit them up. They, they want information. Oh yeah, Gabriella's in there. Uh, DG, Juliet. Yes, please let us know y'all. Um, I, I completely, I'm right there with you. Like TikTok makes no sense to me. I also did never got into Twitter, which is like the weirdest humble brag ever. Like it, it does not make you cool. It's just weird, but yeah, just not a thing I got. So yeah, I, lo I love, I love seeing that, that openness and that like, Hey, this isn't what we do. Well, you should come join us so that we can do it better. <laughs> um, all right. Last question before we, we kind of jump back and talk a little bit more about Riot. Um, a lot of people have been talking lately um, about things like burnout, mental health, um, trying to, to work into more of a work-life integration, since we all know that balance is not really anything that, that anybody is really able to sustain. Um, what, what do you do um, at Riot Games to, to kind of confront the, these issues? Um, you know, is there anything that is like part of your culture that, that goes to supporting each other for this? Is it something that's more, um, you know, more, more professional and more like, uh, you know, organized and formal? Um, tell, let's tell us a, a little bit about how this works at Riot. Um, Preeti, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I think burnout, uh, we use that phrase just 
very uh, generally, right? But for different people, it means different things. For some people that is, I need time off. For other people that is like, I need a hobby. For uh, what I realized on my team uh, during quarantine uh, was that everybody was feeling burnout and it was being talked about a lot. And we actually all kind of got in a room and talked for an hour about like what we were feeling. And it was really funny because we all had these really terrible thoughts that we didn't feel exp- like comfortable expressing, not even forget about to each other, even to out loud to ourselves or to our friends or significant others. And it was things like, you know, I lay up, I, I lie in bed at night and wonder when this pandemic will end. I haven't seen my family. I, I can't, I haven't worked out in eight months. Like all these, like, I guess, confessions and everyone realized that they felt exactly the same. And we had preconceived notions about each other. Like, oh, I'm sure that person is doing fine. Or that person is working out or whatever. No, it, we were all struggling together. And that was the burnout. It wasn't giving people a week off or, you know, having a party or we couldn't, it was COVID, but like having a party on zoom, it was actually like that almost like a weird group therapy thing where we supported each other. And then we all said afterwards, like, Oh, we feel a lot better now. Cause part of that anxiety was like feeling alone. So, um, we all have different techniques for it. Yes. There's like meditation groups. There's people who go running together, but like, I think the important thing with burnout and the thing that riot has done really well is make it okay to talk about it. Sorry, my alarm went off. Um, Didn't okay. even hear it. Okay, well, I did. <laughs> that was so awkward. So um, it's talking about burnout and and being open and vulnerable about it. And like, you know, people were receptive to that. I, I cannot agree with you enough. Um, you know, I mental health is a huge part of, of, you know, my focus and what keeps me sane. And when I started doing things like putting a calendar hold, like, so that people knew, like, you cannot book me for that 45 minute or that uh, hour and 15 minute window because that I'm going to therapy and I might only be going to my couch to go to therapy, but like that, I need to block that time off. And once I started doing that, people came out of the woodwork wanting to talk to me about therapy. Like I'm going through the blah, 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 blah. Do you think I should go to therapy? And almost entirely, almost without like deviation. Yes. Go to therapy. It's like taking your car to, you know, get an oil change. It's just something that everybody should be doing. Nikki, what do you feel on this? Um, You know, is your, is, is, are you similarly feeling that, that, that openness is what really helps create that culture? Yeah. You know, we went through a similar journey um, on uh, my, my team on Valorant where, and it really came from leadership and courage just to sort of get in these rooms and talk about these things. Um, And we discovered it, a, it was the same process that Pri's talking about, but we discovered a different thing. And the thing that was bringing people out was, was uh, their, um, they had too many stakeholders, you know, and it's just, you know what, the world is falling apart during COVID. Can I just have some autonomy, right? And so I think that um, what we discovered was that we reduced our meetings and we reduced the amount of oversight on people's work. And it wasn't about working less hours. It was it was a different thing that we discovered, but it was a similar process where none of us were saying it out loud, but a lot of us were having the same private feeling. So I, I, I think one thing that Riot's been doing and certainly on Valorant is that we just kind of make some space for people to be vulnerable and actually like say the thing that is their like deepest, darkest secret about how their work life feels right now. Um, and, and that's been a positive change. I, I think the pandemic kind of forced us to do that because we, we were just all trying to survive. Oh, yes. I mean, I'm sure it's been done to death, but like we're we're all going through, what was it? Same storm, but different boats was a, a really popular one. Um, and it's, it's honestly ridiculously true. That's why it spread like wildfire because we are not all going through in the same way, the same thing. And that was incredibly, I think, powerful for people to realize, not only so that they could be seen, but also so that they could see like from their leaders, from their managers, from their, you know, from, from their team heads, they being able to see like, Hey, I'm not doing super great today. Well, you're also in the middle of a panini. Okay. So that, you know, it's, this is, you're not supposed to be okay right now. If you're okay right now, I have a lot of questions for you. Um, so yeah, like I, I love this, this transparency and really opening up those conversations. Um, okay. We are at time. However, I want to take time to say thank you uh, to both of our speakers, Preeti and Nikki. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, we did want to talk a little bit about Riot Games culture. Um, so let's talk about your top tips for someone who's interviewing. Um, Nikki, do you want to go first here? 
Yeah, sorry, just struggling to unmute. Um, <laughs> uh, so having deep knowledge of the, of the space, uh, video games, a huge space, right? So it would be too hard to have deep knowledge of all of that. But just for the one particular job that you're talking with someone about, uh, try to know that game or the competitor that's, if they haven't told you what the game is, like a game that's in that genre really well. And that will give you like a really great uh, basis for stuff to talk about in an interview. Cool. Pretty. what about you? So this is very specific to like once you're actually in the interview, but something I always notice is like, we'll ask a question and someone's like, oh my God. And like, we'll either freak out because they're taking too long to answer or like go off on all these random tangents. And something I saw uh, done extremely well, which is actually an intern I ended up hiring. Um, she's great. Was she's like, can I have a moment? And I was like, sure. And she took, like, I'm not joking, like anywhere from 30 seconds to like a full two minutes to write stuff down. And her head was like down while she was writing. And she'd come back and be like, okay. And she'd present her answer and like, okay, one, two, three, four, conclusion, end, whatever, like all the context I needed. And I was like, cool. And we actually finished the interview earlier than I would have normally. So I, when people start to panic or I can sense some like, oh, I don't, I'll be like, hey, this isn't like Jeopardy. Like, take your time and think through your answer. I'm not giving out points for answering quickly. That's not what this is. Yes, I love I love that kind of uh, acknowledgement that people interview in different ways. And if this is how you process information best, and you know that's 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 really important to know and important to communicate to the person who's interviewing you. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely love that. Thank you both for for kind of talking us through these. Um, all right. Last minute, um, we are going to say goodbye. However, I just want to say again, huge thank you, Preeti and Nikki, um, the rest of the Riot Games team, Brian uh, and Joe, who were working with us earlier today. Thank you so much to all of you. Um, Y'all came more than prepared for today's session. It's never just the hour that you see in front of you. Um, and so we are so, so happy to have uh, to have been able to, to enjoy your presence and enjoy your expertise today. Thank you so much for that. Um, and to our attendees today, thank you. This was wonderful. We love to see all this participation. If you are new to Power to Fly and we haven't seen you before, um, you know, if you've, if you've never attended an event or never even heard about us, we are so, so happy to have met you today. Thank you so much for coming. And if you are one of our frequent flyers and we see you all the time, I see you in the chat. Um, thank you so much for coming. We were so, so happy to see you again and cannot wait to see you on another chat coming up soon. Um, don't forget if you, uh, if you wanna check out some of the, um, the jobs for, um, that Riot Games is currently hiring for, you can take a look at their um, Power to Fly page. I'm gonna share that link again for you here in the chat. Um, and we are super, super, super happy to have, uh, you know, been able to celebrate and end today's Wednesday on such an amazing chat. So thank you to everyone. Um, that is it for me. Uh, and we will be back with more great programming for you tomorrow. So have a nice night and we'll see you later. Bye guys. <laughs>